Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Carl Clare. On behalf of the Center for Public Interest Advocacy and Collaboration and the Center for Law, Information, and Creativity, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to our symposium on gig workers' rights, the future of employment, and the future of democracy. We will survey these questions on a broad canvas and also address, uh, in particular, the initiative petition uh, being sponsored by Uber, Lyft, DoorDash, and other <laughs> business interests that is very likely to appear on the ballot in Massachusetts in 2022. I need to make three announcements, please. Uh, we are recording this event, but we will stop recording during the question and answer and discussion period. So uh, you will be uh, recorded. Uh, second, pursuant to Northeastern's uh, COVID protocol, I have to ask you to please keep your mask on, except when you're actively eating and uh, drinking. Uh, third, uh, before we begin, I'd like to give a shout out and express gratitude to uh, CPX Managing Director, Shannon Al-Wakil, whose tireless and skillful work brought this uh, project to, to, to fruition. Uh, Shannon is joining us uh, remotely from California today. Uh, I'm thrilled to introduce our fabulous panel. We are very lucky to have uh, speakers at, at this level. Uh, we're first we'll hear from Professor Dina Duval at UC Hastings Law School, whose distinguished research and writing focuses on the intersection of law, technology, low wage and precarious work, and organizing particularly with respect to the so-called platform economy. Vina holds a PhD in addition to her law degree and has studied and written about the lives and experiences of workers uh, in the San Francisco area taxi and ride hailing industries. She publishes not only in top law reviews and journals, but also in the popular news media. Her work has been cited by the California Supreme Court and her profile combines activism and public ad advocacy with academics. Professor Duval was a close activist observer of how the issues we're going to discuss today played out recently in California, uh, culminating in their Prop 22 referendum, uh, which is the basis of the Massachusetts initi initiative. Next, we'll hear from Jason Jackson who is Professor of Political Economy and Urban Planning at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Jason's research focuses on the relationship between states and markets, and particularly on the role of economic ideas and moral beliefs in shaping market institutions. He studies contexts ranging from the politics of monopoly and foreign investment in India to the so-called sharing economy and urban transportation markets uh, in contemporary cities in Asia, Europe, and the United States. Jason is a member of the Task Force on the Work of the Future at MIT. And in the course of his distinguished academic career, Jason has also worked with numerous private, non-governmental, and multilateral organizations in the Caribbean, South Africa, and the United States. We are delighted to welcome D. Beth Griffith, the board chair and executive director of the Boston Independent Drivers Guild. Beth is an internationally certified green infrastructure practitioner, one of the few Afro-Latina women holding this designation. Her passion is teaching, community organizing, and giving back. She has 17 years of experience in the nonprofit sector, working on training, team building, project management, and public speaking. She's taught workshops at Suffolk University about entrepreneurship for women of color, co-hosted webinars that showcase the benefits of owning a business, and made appearances on the Black Community Information Center's Drumbeat radio show. Finally, we will hear remotely from our very own Peter Enrich, an emeritus professor at Northeastern University School of Law. Um, where he specialized during his teaching career in state and local government law, state and local tax and fiscal policy, and intergovernmental relations. Peter served as general counsel to the Massachusetts Executive Office for Administration and Finance under Governors Dukakis and Weld before he joined the law school's faculty in 1991. 
He frequently advises advocacy groups and state and local governments and argued an important state taxation case before the United States Supreme Court in 2006. Peter's career also combines activism and political engagement with academic scholarship. Among other accomplishments, he was an elected member of the Town of Lexington Board of Selectmen. Before proceeding to the panelists, I'm going to take a few minutes to provide some background to set out the, the legal context of today's discussion and to explain what the Massachusetts Initiative Petition will do if it is enacted by the voters. Uh, and uh, I've passed out a handout. I'm going to put the slides on the share screen. Okay, two points. The first background point concerns a practice, uh, particularly in the United States to a lesser extent in other countries, of basing social protection programs uh, on the employment relationship. In the United States, our law privatizes the delivery of many critical social protections and benefits into the paid employment relationship. I have some examples here, the National Labor Relations Act guaranteeing the right to unionize and engage in concerted activity applies to employees. The Fair Labor Standards Act uh, guarantees, uh, uh, supposed to guarantee a living wage, uh, but that again is only for persons in paid employment. Unemployment insurance benefits are available only to persons that have a, a work history and earnings history in paid labor markets and continuing attachment to the paid uh, workforce. Social security retirement, what people commonly call social security, uh, bases retirement benefits also on a work history um, and uh, an earnings record um, in paid, uh, paid labor. So, uh, and the same is true under many parallel state laws. So under these programs, an individual and by indirectly the dependents uh, uh, are placed on one side or another of a line between employees and non-employees. And that determines whether they can access social benefits. If you are an employee, you are entitled to these social benefits. If you're not an employee, you are ineligible. If you don't have the earnings history, you're ineligible. You may retire and have no other source of income, but as far as society is concerned, you're on your own. If you don't have the earnings history, have a nice day. Uh, the, um, sorry, I'm... Okay. Now, in all of these social programs, there are exclusions. One gigantic exclusion, very revealing about the kind of society we live in, is the exclusion from all employment-based benefits of persons who perform unpaid and non-wage work. And in every society in the world, uh, virtually those are predominantly women. Um, uh, this, this exclusion of unpaid work from social protection uh, is a symbol of the structural subordination of women uh, in, in our economy. Some of the exclusions are explicitly placed in the various statutes like the National Labor Relations Act. The most famous and important ones in the 1930s were agricultural, domestic, and hotel employees. They were paid employees, but they were explicitly excluded. And what that is about is the insistence of the Southern Democratic senators on maintaining the plantation economy and the structural subordination of, of people of color in the South. Those job categories were predominantly filled uh, by people of, of, of color. Now, today we're gonna focus on another important exclusion from employment-based benefits. 
Independent contractors work for money, but they are excluded from most of these programs by the way uh, employee is defined. So for millions of people and indirectly their families, whether they can access social benefits and social protections turns on whether they're classified as employees or independent contractors. Here are some examples of independent contractors, surgeon, lawyer, owner of a construction company. What is the rationale? The typical rationale is that social protection is for people who need it because they do not have the economic clout to achieve social protection on their own. They can't bargain for it, for example, in contracts. Theory is independent contractors are in business for themselves. They invest capital in search of entrepreneurial profit. They can take care of themselves. They do not need social protection. Now, let's assume for purposes of discussion that that rationale, rationale makes good policy sense. It's, of course, highly controversial. Many people favor universal benefits. Um, here are the risks and problems of the independent contractor exclusion. First of all, where legislatures and courts draw the line between employees and independent contractors may or typically may not reflect and divide the groups uh, that actually are in need of or not in need of social protection. The, the, it's, it's, it's a very poor marker of uh, social policy questions. Second, the existence of the exclusion creates a huge incentive for employers to misclassify their employees as independent contractors. If they do so, they can evade unionization, they don't have to pay social taxation, like uh, uh, you know, payroll taxation for uh, social security. Uh, they uh, can uh, escape social responsibility, which society has placed on them. And in so doing, they can undermine social programs that took generations of political struggle uh, 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 by people to achieve. Now, there is a third problem. Um, under the antitrust laws, it is illegal. It is a felony to combine in the marketplace. Workers combine in unions to raise their uh, wages. That was for a long time a felony in the United States and union leaders went to prison. Eventually, a labor exemption was created beginning in the Clayton Act, which has this remarkable sentence, would that uh, Congress actually believed it, the labor of a human being is not a commodity. But the labor exemption, it's a long story, it applies only to uh, working people who are identified by law as employees in the technical sense. Independent contractors, if they combine to unionize, they run the risk of uh, committing a crime uh, or civil wrong under the antitrust laws. So what's the upshot? There's this obscure question. The cases are incredibly boring. I hate to assign them, but who's an employee and who's an independent contractor? But it has always been a question of great social significance in the United States for a century because of our employment-based uh, uh, social programs. This is explosively true today because we now have many employers, the so-called platform employers, who are using a business model that depends on classifying all of the workers as independent contractors. Uh, okay. Now, second point, how do we draw the line between employees and independent contractors? As I say, this is a long story. It's been going on for 200 years, uh, simplifying it greatly in the interest of time. There is the so-called progressive approach. <coughs> the progressive approach strains to give employee a broad definition and to give independent contractor a narrow definition. 
And the goal is to carry out the humane aspirations of our social programs to create a broad, wide social safety net. In Massachusetts, we use the progressive approach, and the courts actually use that phrase sometimes, uh, for example, with respect to unemployment insurance. Uh, in Massachusetts, a worker is deemed an employee unless the proponent of independent, of independent contractor status meets the burden of proving three things. The worker is free from employer direction. The worker's uh, services are provided outside the usual course of the employer's business. And the worker is customarily engaged in an independent business. So the idea is that this test, maybe it errs you know, in, in, in going too far, but it is designed to uh, exclude as independent contractors only workers who are truly in business for themselves and cover uh, all of the other people. Uh, now, this test is in one version or another used in uh, several other states, and it has come to be known as the ABC test. Uh, Now, federal statutes, again, I'm simplifying, but federal statutes and many state courts, instead of using the ABC test, they use the common law tests. The common law tests were devised over 200 years ago to solve a problem that has nothing to do with modern social legislation. All first year students in torts know about the problem of respondeat superior liability, of businesses for torts of their workers. And the common law rule was that the uh, business was liable for torts committed by employees, not independent contractors. And so they devised a test to make that distinction, uh, uh, solving a problem that has nothing to do with the 21st century. The common law tests are friendly to finding the employee uh, 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 I'm sorry, independent contractor status. The burden of proof to prove employee status is on the proponent of employee status. And the common law tests are a squishy a morass of um, uh, factors. Here's the restatement. You don't have to look at the whole thing, but skill, kind of occupation, locality, length of time, method of payment. This, this squishy test makes litigation on behalf of employees expensive, complicated, and risky, and gives huge discretion to, to decision, decision makers to find independent contractor status. So coming to a close, Massachusetts now uses the ABC test to determine coverage under our local social programs, minimum wage, unemployment insurance, Massachusetts paid family and medical leave. Um, the Attorney General, Maura Healy, a graduate of our law school, I'm proud to say, has taken the position in court uh, that most gig workers are employees within these Massachusetts statutes. The principal legal effect of what will be on the ballot in 2022 will be to prevent Massachusetts from using the ABC test, the progressive approach in classifying gig workers. Uh, and essentially by statute, put the gig and platform workers into the group of independent contractors um, uh, not entitled to social benefits with the consequences that our uh, speakers will, uh, will explain. So, uh, Thank you for that. I'll take this off. Uh, uh, here. Okay, we're back on the. Uh, Shannon, you're going to uh, bring us our speakers. Uh, and first, I'd like to introduce with, with great pride, uh, Professor Vina Dubal, coming to us from uh, California. Thank you so much. I'm deeply honored to be here um, on such a distinguished panel. And um, oh, it's so funny to see, I can see myself 
<laughs> on the screen in, um, um, in the larger classroom. So it's so nice to be here. I wish I was there physically. Um, I'm very excited that there is so much interest in, pro in this proposition in Massachusetts before it goes on the ballot. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about the California context. And of course, California, um, what is being put on the ballot in Massachusetts is almost the exact same um, as what was put on the ballot in California. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what happened here um, and, and sort of why it happened and how perhaps we can do things differently in the Massachusetts context. So I'll start by um, sort of leaving off where, where, where Carl um, where, where Professor Claire left off and just tell you what, what this proposition actually um, does. So it essentially, I would argue that rather than relegating workers to the sort of independent contractor category, I would argue that it relegates them to a third category where they're really unable to, um, to mobilize, to organize for something better. Um, so it constricts them contractually. The idea with an independent contractor, of course, you can imagine a traditional independent contractor, maybe a plumber or a carpenter who goes to, um, who's hired by, by a um, by hiring entity, say a family, and they negotiate the price. Um, and that independent contractor has the power to negotiate the price. They have some power over their working conditions. Um, in this context, what Proposition 22 did was it took all of these workers outside um, who were considered employees under California law. There was active litigation and even an injunction um, which attempted to force these workers to th these companies to treat them as employees. And it put them into this ambiguous category where they couldn't contract for anything better like a real small business person could do. Um, and simultaneously, they didn't have access to any of these basic benefits. Um, I'll, uh, I'll tell you just a little bit more. So they, they argued essentially that um, that these workers would have new benefits that you know no workers had ever had before, and you'll see this if you haven't already in the um, immense amount of advertising that that goes into the, the Massachusetts um, bill. But all of these so-called benefits were second-rate benefits at best. So um, they they said that workers would get health care. In fact, what workers got um, was a health care subsidy. And this was a problem for two reasons, because um, most workers didn't qualify for the subsidy because you had to work a certain number of, um, of engaged hours to get that subsidy. Um, and it was only available to those who already had health insurance. And by and large, we're talking about a workforce of subordinated racial minority and immigrant people who are on the margins of, this, of, of the economy who have um, who have no um, who have are, are on are on state um, uh, Cal, uh, on, on state insurance um, for, for health insurance. So they weren't even eligible for it. So let me back up and I'll, before I tell you more about how terrible the, the, the bill actually was or the proposition actually is and, and the proposition that they're introduced in Massachusetts is, and I'll tell you how they got it passed. Um, they, they argued, they made three strong arguments um, and they just stuck to, their, to, their, um, to, these, to these statements. One, they said that workers wanted this, that most workers wanted to be independent contractors. Two, they said that moving to an employment model would eliminate jobs for millions of workers. And three, they said that uh, workers needed flexibility and that flexibility and employment could not coexist. Um, these seem very compelling, um, really, um, you know, certainly swayed a huge portion of the electorate, um, but I want to disaggregate these for you as you go into this fight. So this idea that workers want to be independent contractors, um, I'll first tell you that the studies that they rely on are hugely flawed. Um, they essentially, as a question, uh, as a survey question, they say, would you rather be an independent contractor and have um, and have flexible time, or would you 
uh, be an employee and have minimum benefits. And so they shape how workers think about independent contracting and employment. Um, it turns out the vast majority of Americans don't know the difference between employee and independent contractor. Um, and in fact, as, as all of the academics in the room can tell you, there is nothing about being an employee that precludes you from having a flexible schedule. This, this um, idea is a fiction invented by the companies and really driven home in their PR marketing, both to, to the workers themselves, who then think, oh my God, if we move to an employment model, I'm not gonna be able to have a flexible schedule. Um, and to the voting public who thinks, oh, that now these workers would just have to move to a nine to five schedule, which is of course not true. And I'm happy to answer more about that in the, um, in the Q and A. Um, this, the other central argument is that they, they, they said that moving to an employment model would eliminate jobs for millions of workers. And I'll give you the California statistics and, um, and this is, um, likely the same in Massachusetts. So of course the companies hold all the data, so it's hard to know. Um, in California, 70% of workers are subordinated racial minorities and immigrants. Um, that is also true nationally. Lyft says that 68% of their workers are subordinated racial minorities and workers and immigrant workers. Um, of the people, they, they say that most of their workers are casual. And while that might be true as, um, as a statistical matter, 70% of the work done on these apps are done by workers who work more than 35 hours a week. So the most of the work that is done um, for these companies is done by workers who work anywhere between 40 and 60 hours a week. So we're talking about full-time and more than full-time work. This is not casual work for most of the people or for the people who do the bulk of the work. Um, the second thing that I would add, and I think this is really important, is this is really, really hard, um, terrible, uh, precarious work. And so a lot of the people who join actually quit within six months. And so according to the industry's own studies, something like 67% of people um, after six months of doing this work quit. And so when they say all of these millions of people would eliminate their um, would eliminate all of these jobs for all of these people, they're really talking about um, a group of people who have already opted out, who have already left, who have already quit because this is really, really difficult, precarious work, um, not, not remunerative. And the people that are left, the people that have been doing it for years, um, the people that continue to do it for years are again, the people the bulk of the, that are doing the bulk of the work. So we're talking about um, a, a, a full, a full-time, more than full-time workforce, most of whom are immigrants. Um, these people do need flexibility, but they can have both flexibility and employment. So it's, it's you know, there's in this, in this um, debate, I tell you this in this debate, because this is what you're gonna hear. And um, these, are the, these are the retorts. Um, I also wanna just emphasize, I'm gonna share my screen for a second. Um, oh, sorry, can you, dis can you enable screen sharing if that's possible for me? Shannon. Um, okay. I also just want to emphasize that the way that they got this um, this bill passed, in addition to sort of using these um, these really um, these these three arguments, is that they argued that this was a racially just bill uh, bill or proposition. They really relied upon um, a rhetoric. Sorry, a rhetoric of um, of, of, of racial justice. So they put up these ads um, all over the country, but including in, um, in historic Oakland, uh, if you tolerate racism, delete Uber. Now this was happening at the, um, at the height of the pandemic, which was disproportionately affecting African-American workers and disproportionately affecting California transportation workers. Um, simultaneously, we are in the midst of the Black Lives Matters uprising. So they were really trying to use this political moment um, to argue somehow perversely that, uh, that passing a law that took away rights for this workforce was somehow just. Um, in, the, um, in the days leading up to, the months leading up to the proposition, um, you know, Dara Khosra Shahi wrote this whole manifesto of how Uber was an anti-racist company pointing to how they were trying to um, create, uh, create more diversity within um, the core of the firm. Of course, ignoring the fact that all of the labor and value produced 
for the firm was being produced by subordinated racial minority and immigrant workers who were not who did not even have access to the minimum wage. Um, Lyft started to talk about how they were going to give free rides to people to um, in, in poor areas so they could have grocery access, um, job access, etc. Of course, this sounds really good until you realize that Lyft and Uber together have taken millions, if not billions of dollars away from the public transportation infrastructure, which of course, um, uh, immigrant and racial minority folks rely on so heavily. Um, these are some of the images that they used during the campaign, again, um, using a rhetoric of, of, um, of race and racial justice. Um, they talked a lot about, they had sort of um, drivers do these selfie videos talking about how much they needed this work and how Prop 22 was going to take everything away from them. Um, they hired actors like this woman, Alicia, um, paid them um, to have these texts just broadcast all over California. We all got them on our phones. They had direct access to each one of us, to each voter to shape how we understood what this law was. Um, uh, but some workers, including the Rideshare Drivers United in, um, in California who were super organized, um, tried to, to, call, to call them out on using, um, on using race to pass a racially unjust law. So although the California NAACP, which Scott was getting donations from Uber and Lyft and some branches of um, the National Urban League and the Si Se Puede Foundation joined Uber and Lyft and Instacart and DoorDash in supporting this proposition, I think this is one of the most shame, shameful, um, shameful parts of history. This is not happening in Massachusetts, luckily. Um, uh, the drivers them said, said, look, and this goes back to what Professor Claire was saying, look, just like domestic workers and farm workers, all of whom were African Americans, when we got the New Deal passed, these were the, um, the children and grandchildren of slaves, just like all of these people were carved out of the New Deal protections. Now, these, in, these technology industrialists are trying to carve out another whole sector of the economy that is primarily people of color from um, from the protections and social benefits, the few protections and social benefits that people have in the United States. Um, and they'd staged a counter protest to this terrible ad that you see um, here in historic Oakland, home to home to this, you know, to, to many, many prominent civil rights movements, to the black power struggle. Um, and they said, if you support racial justice, vote no on Prop 22. And at this protest, some of the black workers said, look, you cannot erase our experiences and divide our bodies in this way. And I really want to, to emphasize what, what they're talking about here. Um, I think it's, it is, it is in, sort of instinctive to us as we look at this to say like, look, this is horrible and terrible and how can they say this? But what the, what the drivers were saying was, look, you cannot say we're gonna donate money to criminal justice organizations while simultaneously um, looking at the market as though it were not a place of racial injustice. We are experiencing racial injustice in the market. We are experiencing racial injustice um, in, in, in the world of criminal justice and these things are related. Um, and before I end, I feel like I, maybe I'm running out of time. Is that what someone is trying to tell me? Um, I, I wanna just say that, the, that I wanna explain this key thing that you have to understand in order to understand why this is so bad for workers and why it's really dangerous for, um, not just for app-based workers, but for all workers, for the entire labor sector. And I'll explain why in a second. So they kept saying during the campaign, and they'll say this in, in, in Massachusetts too, that the, the proposition provides 120% of the minimum wage. And that sounds awesome. But they doesn't provide 120% of the minimum wage and only provides that for what, what the companies call engaged time. So they've essentially done what industrialists have tried to do for over a century, which is get rid of the minimum wage. So only after a worker is um, allocated a ride does the clock start ticking for payment. So all of the time that they spend looking for work, um, waiting for an algorithm to give, them, um, to give them work, all of that time is completely unpaid. Now, all of the so-called benefits in the proposition are also tied to engaged time. So this, what this does is it, um, it essentially uh, makes legal piecework in the app-based economy, but it's almost worse than piecework that, that, was, that people experienced at the earlier part of the, the 20th century and the late 19th century, because in this instance, these workers have no idea 
why or when they are allocated an algorithm. When you as an Uber or Lyft um, consumer call an Uber or Lyft, you are not necessarily getting the car closest to you. you there is a complicated calculation mm -hmm. that happens that matches you with a worker. And included in that calculation are things like, is the company punishing, algorithmically punishing that particular worker and not giving them a ride because they declined too many, too many, um, too many rides in the past day? Or is that worker getting, um, getting really close to their bonus, which the company doesn't want to give them? And if they're getting really close to their bonus, maybe they're not going to get allocated work um, as quickly as, as someone who's far away from their bonus. And so the company controls the engaged time. Um, it's completely unpredictable for workers. And it means that some 40 to 60% of time that a worker labors goes unpaid. Um, essentially, again, making it piecework. Um, I'll end by saying that in my own scholarship, I've called this the, the new racial wage code, this innovation, the new racial wage code. Um, and in saying this, I've built on what, um, what civil rights and, and, um, and, and civil rights leaders in the early part of the 20th century when, when, um, these, when the New Deal laws that Professor Clare was talking about, uh, when these laws were first passed. Uh, Southern industrialists, Southern plantation owners wanted um, when, when they were negotiating um, wages with the government prior to the passage of the Fair Labor Standards Act, um, they, when these wage codes were established, they were trying to establish racial wage codes for their black workers. And they argued, look, black workers are inefficient. Black families don't need as much money as, um, as white families do. And so uh, we're just going to give them lower wages, a lower a racial wage code for, for these African-American workers. And um, if you don't pass these lower minimum wages for African-American workers, then we're just gonna take away all their jobs and give them to white workers. Um, the NAACP and, and, and George Weaver was, was one of the NAACP leaders who, who later went into government, a Harvard trained economist, um, argued and fought really hard against this. And one of the things that he, real, that he emphasized, and I wanna emphasize and end here, is that not only would this um, the, a, a racial wage code destroy sort of advances that African-Americans have made, he said it would destroy any possibility of an ever forming a strong and effective labor movement in the nation because it would relegate low wage African American workers to a lower caste and put a, the, the le a legal stamp of approval on, um, on that caste. And that is precisely what Prop 22 did and what I'm worried um, the proposition in Massachusetts will do. What you have going for you that we did not have going for you, us, are precisely these types of conversations. You have the opportunity to sort of understand and know what was going on, to not fall for their propaganda, um, and to fight and make sure that whatever Massachusetts voters vote on in the, in the, um, in the coming months, they, um, they understand. Uh, the long-term and immediate ramifications of it. After Prop 22 passed, venture capitalists in California said right away, they even wrote an, uh, one of them wrote an op-ed in the information. He said, Prop 22 makes possible for us to now go into other sectors, to go into healthcare, to do this to healthcare, to do this to retail, to do this to restaurant work, to do this to the, um, to the hotel industry. Um, and these are industries, some of them that have strong union presence that are good middle-class jobs um, that provide security and safety for many, many Americans. Um, and so I think that also, as we think about this, this proposition, we really have to emphasize that and understand that this is not just about app-based workers. Um, this is really about all workers because all work can be gigified. Thank you so much. Thank you, so, uh, thank you so much for that, uh, that fantastic presentation. Uh, and now, uh, Jason. So hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here um, discussing this issue, uh, especially with this great group of panelists. Um, so thanks very much, Carl. Um, and Shannon for organizing. Um, so I thought what I would do uh, today is um, try to say a little bit about what um, I see happening and playing out globally. Um, so following right along um, Carl's layout of some of the legal issues um, and then Vina's discussion of what's taken place 
um, in California, I think provides a really nice starting point for thinking about how this conversation is, is happening globally. Um, and the main point that I'd like to make here is that this issue is gaining global traction. Um, and in particular, people around the world, uh, when I say people, I mean um, people on the labor side, so labor activists um, in the sort of ride hailing delivery, but sort of broader platform and gig economy space, um, are paying very close attention to developments in other jurisdictions, um, as are policymakers, um, and I think also the courts. Um, and I think in this respect, um, the developments that have taken place um, in California around Prop 22 uh, and also AB5, which preceded um, Prop 22 and maybe uh, sparked Prop 22 as a, as a sort of response, um, are really informing some of the debates um, that we see elsewhere. So what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about some work that I've been doing um, uh, with a number of uh, great graduate students um, and undergraduates um, at MIT for the political economy lab uh, in thinking about these issues of right dealing globally. Now, and I think there are two broad ways of kind of approaching this. That's what I'll do is sort of lay out a very um, simple sketch um, of, of some of the dynamics we see around the world. Um, the first is thinking about this issue as it plays out along um, the divide of formal versus informal. That is, to what extent does, um, in any given country context, um, does the understanding um, both sort of legally and politically uh, of how labor markets work fall along the divide of formal versus informal or, or not? Um, and then secondly, trying to highlight the sort of politics um, that are at play in a few of the places where we've done work um, on the ground. So I'll talk about maybe four or five places. Um, so first in thinking about um, uh, spaces, um, so country context um, where I think uh, really the courts have been at the forefront um, in uh, determining what's happening around this issue of classification in the platform economy. I'm certain the first place that probably comes to mind is the United Kingdom. Um, and back in February of this year, there was a major decision, um, the case of versus Aslam, um, that really directly addressed this issue of worker classification. Um, and there, the UK Supreme Court ruled in favor of um, drivers, essentially, um, suggesting that Uber needed to classify them um, as, um, as workers. Um, and there are a couple of key issues that are just maybe worth pointing out um, very quickly um, in the Uber case. Um, the first part of this is that um, uh, a key part of the issue, or issue uh, that the court um, addressed was the issue of control. Um, and this, I think, speaks to um, where Avina just left off a few moments ago uh, in talking about issues, for example, of engaged time versus unengaged time, the extent to which um, drivers, for example, in the platform and delivery space um, are directed uh, by the platforms through algorithms and so forth. Um, and this goes back also to what um, Carl noted in front of the ABC test. So this is a key issue. The other issue though, which was kind of front and center, and this um, I think we're seeing in some other parts of the world as well, was the issue of bargaining power. That is the courts explicitly in their decisions talked about um, questions of bargaining power between contracting parties. That is the extent to which the court should intervene in an otherwise contractual relationship between two parties because there was disproportionate power on one side or the other. So this played in directly into the UK decision. And I think this element um, is also showing up uh, in some other cases um, around the world. Now the UK case, was crucial, I think, in um, providing uh, sort of impetus um, for many, um, especially activists on the labor side, um, to think about ways in which um, that ruling might have influenced in their own jurisdictions. Um, and one place I want to note um, here is South Africa. Um, so through field work we've been doing on the ground um, in South Africa, particularly in the Johannesburg area, um, with one of our students, Ahab Habib, I really found from uh, interviewing uh, workers um, on the ground, that there was a sense that, you know, how can we use um, the UK ruling um, to think about ways in which we can try to foster similar kinds of reactions um, uh, in the courts um, through, uh, um, through legal strategies um, in South Africa. And I'd be kind of interested um, maybe in the Q&A to, to hear um, Carl's um, thoughts as given his expertise on South Africa and um, labor law. Um, but again, the kind of key point was the extent to which people are paying very close attention to what was happening um, in the, the UK um, in this decision. Um, another context um, that I, I wanted to talk about where this is playing out very actively in the courts um, right now, um, and again, I think where the sort of um, the courts are taking a, a kind of lead, um, is in Brazil. So in Brazil, at this precise moment, there's no federal legislation on this issue of worker classification. That said, gains have been made um, in the lower and regional courts in Brazil, um, that is gains in favor of drivers, um, where uh, courts have ruled in a number of instances um, that um, drivers should be recognized as workers. One example is the case of the Souza um, versus uh, Uber. However, what's been happening there um, is on one hand, workers are gaining traction um, through the lower courts um, in Brazil, but then these have been struck down um, by the higher courts. 
So a tension that's playing out in the Brazilian context appears to be between the lower and the higher courts and with these different interpretations um, of how to make sense of the classification issue. Uh, most recently, and by this I mean just last week, um, a colleague in Brazil, Renan Khalil, who's a federal prosecutor, um, along with a number of colleagues has filed um, a major lawsuit against Uber precisely along these issues. So it'll be very interesting um, to kind of watch in real time what's playing out um, uh, in Brazil uh, in this respect. So the cases that I've just described, or the sort of the, the, the dynamics of the three places, the UK, South Africa, and Brazil that I've just described, um, I, I kind of see very much as falling maybe along the lines of um, spaces where the issue has been, much like in the US, one of how to think about workers in this space as formal sector workers, right, who are covered by various forms of legislation. By contrast, um, there are many number of country contexts um, where um, workers um, in the platform uh, economy are seen within a broader category of informal workers. Um, with different sets of um, rights, um, both with respect to those who pay them, um, as well as different claims on the state uh, for social protection. And this point goes back again um, to where Carl began in talking about the importance of the employee relationship in the United States uh, in terms of access uh, to social protection. So let's mention three places very quickly. Um, the first is India, um, where um, a big part of the um, Indian, um, by far the overwhelming part of the uh, Indian labor market um, is seen as occupying, um, doing work rather uh, in the so-called unorganized sectors. Unorganized sectors, what the informal sector is called uh, in India, is well over 90% uh, of the non-agricultural labor force. Um, but more recently, just the last year, um, there were three bills that were passed um, in the legislature in India that sought to try to um, get a grip uh, with this emerging uh, issue of the platform economy, which has become huge um, by some estimates of the 200 million workers um, in India who have been working um, in the platform um, economy. Um, and there are two key things I'll just note from two um, of these bill, the bills. Um, the first in the Code of Wages, um, we try to use the issue of wages um, as a way of defining um, what an employee is. And with the rate wage relationship um, being the key uh, sort of determinant um, of, this, um, uh, of this distinction. However, um, and a key person who's been working on this in India, um, a colleague at Diki Suri, uh, notes that one of the problems uh, with this approach is that on one hand, it suggests that it offers a way through which uh, workers could gain um, benefits, um, but not labor rights of other sorts, right? So it draws a distinction in the kinds of claims um, that workers can make on um, the platforms. Um, a second um, and the other uh, sort of uh, of these three uh, pieces of legislation that I'll mention uh, very briefly in India, I uh, was the code on social security, uh, which allowed platform workers um, to make claims for things like maternity, um, disability, old age protection, and so forth. But there are two key things here. So these um, uh, these benefits would come from the state, not from uh, employee, not from the uh, presumed employers um, like the platforms. First. But secondly, um, it doesn't guarantee these kinds of benefits um, to workers. So really the extent to which workers would be able to actually realize these um, would depend on local decisions. Um, and so again, that just is another uh, space where we can highlight the importance of local politics uh, in determining whether or not uh, workers are actually able to benefit um, from some of these kinds of legislative changes. So it will depend on, um, for example, the politics um, at the state level um, in India. Um, finally, just to mention two other um, con country contexts um, in Southeast Asia. Um, so the first in Thailand, um, where again, uh, huge, um, the platform economy, the economy is massive, especially in the delivery and ride hailing spaces. Um, but again, the way that our employment classification works there, workers fall in this category of the informal. Um, and just as in uh, neighboring um, Singapore, they're just recently been making moves to try to pull together advisory um, councils and so forth, to try to think about ways of addressing um, this issue. I'll just end by noting um, the Singaporean case, which is particularly um, interesting for a couple of reasons. So um, an advisory committee was just put together um, just two months ago in September. So again, these issues are really just playing up themselves out right now um, in almost in, in real time. Um, and a couple of key things that the advisory committee noted um, in its very first meeting was on one hand, of course, as we see elsewhere in the world, um, the issue of the lack of basic job protections um, due to the, the sort of unique nature of platform work very different kinds of work from uh, that which um, underpinned the creation of labor laws the two centuries ago, as um, both Carl and Dina have noted. Um, but also, I'm highlighting a couple of key things which are very important in the Singaporean context, um, things like issues like retirement, for example, but also housing. So in Singapore, housing is a crucial um, sort of uh, mechanism or category through which the state has historically delivered um, 
delivered social protection. So as you can imagine, um, Singapore is a city state, land uh, and space is at a premium. Um, and the, I think something like um, over 80%, over 90% of housing in Singapore is actually state owned. So your access to housing for most Singaporean citizens, and I'll come back to the citizenship uh, issue in a moment, really depends on the state. Um, so the state owns the vast majority of housing, mostly apartment buildings, and people get sort of like long-term um, uh, lease arrangements um, to be able to occupy this housing. And so one of the key things that's recognized here is this uh, way in which um, housing serves again, as been in the uh, historically been the case in Singapore, um, as a way through which to deliver um, social um, benefits. One thing I'll note very quickly um, is the issue of migrant workers. And I think here, um, sort of migration status um, in the employment market is an interesting mirror to, it's not the same, of course, um, but it's an interesting uh, mirror and dimension that we need to consider, just like, uh, for example, Vina noted, um, thinking about race um, in the United States. So in cases in places like South Africa, for example, um, a significant proportion of platform workers are not South African. Um, they're from neighboring countries like Malawi, Zimbabwe, Zambia, etc. And this really replicates a pattern of migration for work that of course goes back to the apartheid era, right? So we have to think about from the labor market perspective, think about the entire South Southern African region as a sort of labor pool from which um, various forms of, um, uh, from which, let's call them employers, but firms and within South Africa draw. Um, and so the employment status uh, really turns in part um, on issues of citizenship. And in the Singaporean context, it's very much the same. Um, a significant proportion of platform workers in Singapore, not Singaporean citizens, they're drawn from other parts of Southeast Asia. And they have very different rights um, than do their um, Singaporean colleagues, um, even doing the same kind of work. And this comes back right back to the issue of um, the way in which social benefits have historically been delivered in Singapore, which is through the citizen relationship, for example, through housing. So I'll stop there just to kind of uh, zoom back out again and just know quickly. Um, two ways, you know, perhaps of thinking about this issue sort of broadly. One along this issue of the uh, way in which um, labor markets are considered or are governed um, through formal or informal sorts of mechanisms on one hand. And then second, thinking about the way in which um, local politics um, at the national and subnational levels really play themselves out and determine kind of outcomes uh, in these uh, places. Thanks very much. Thank you, Jason. And now we'll hear from Beth. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. So what I'm going to be discussing is just basically the organizing part of what's going on, especially when it comes to gig workers and some of the challenges that there are and, you know, and the benefits of organizing as well. And so one of the challenges that Vina already illustrated is that the big tech companies like Uber and Lyft have access to all of the drivers, all of the app-based workers in the state, and they don't like to share their data. They don't share their data. So those are some of the challenges when it comes to organizing app-based workers. And also another one, like we are 70% black, brown, and immigrant. And English, a lot of times, may not be a driver's first language, or maybe they understand English. However, they don't read or write English very well. They're, they're more comfortable with communicating in their native tongue. And so that does raise some challenges. And you know, usually what happens, people and drivers reach out to our guild when they have an issue with an app, with an app-based company like Uber or Lyft. And we are focusing on being proactive instead of reactive. And one of the benefits that's going on, I can say social media has been a big benefit from us, especially in engaging with app-based workers through just videos, getting it out there, having meetings, letting them know, you know, if they have any issues to contact our organization and that we can see how we can help. Um, basically being, you know, it's really important when it comes to organizing too, we have to be really transformational. We have to focus on being transformational instead of being transactional. 
And one benefit that we, another benefit that we also have, which kind of California did it, they had that Prop 22 question happen in the middle of COVID. You know, no, no one was doing the community organizing, knocking on the doors. You know, people were, you know, weren't going to the grocery store. People were getting, you know, groceries, packages delivered to their house. Whereas now we know what we need to do to keep people safe. And now we can, you know, we can actually, we are organizing. And also we've worked on building a powerful coalition, which, you know, Lena, even though she's in California, she's a part of, our organization is a part of, a lot of the unions and local community organizations have come together and we're collaborating with each other and connecting with each other and using, you know, our client lists, our, you know, our member lists to actually organize. Because if you're thinking 70%, you know, black, brown immigrant, well, more than likely there's a chance that our at base drivers probably are not going to be a lot of those citizens and even have the right to vote when it comes to, you know, the Prop 22 clone coming to Massachusetts. So it's really important that we engage all our registered voters, you know, get into the high schools, get into the colleges and, you know, really focus on um, registering our younger population like you guys. And, you know, and the benefit of just engaging with the younger population, millennials and the younger like myself is um, at least 70% of us are progressives. We care about workers having rights. We want, we don't want workers to be, you know, face discrimination or face homelessness, or a lot of our workers are dependent contractors because like Vina said, a high majority of them, they don't make enough money. They're on, you know, Medicaid, Medicare, they're on state subsidized insurance. They receive SNAP benefits, which are also known as food stamps. They're receiving subsidies, um, housing, healthcare. And so that's also real, you know, really important. We really have to get, we have to get and we have to go where our drivers are at and where people are at. And we just, it's really good that we do have more time because we've been able to build a great coalition and a great network of community leaders. And that's one of the advantages that we have as well. And this is also something that we can do, have, um, have forms like this, have town halls, um, another thing I will say also to something that I've noticed is now what they're doing is, I don't know if any of you young people go grocery shopping, but if you go to Trader Joe's, you like Trader Joe's like me, Whole Foods, you know, Shaw's is around the corner, any of the local markets, you're going to be running into people that, you know, they're going to say, oh, do you want to help Uber and Lyft drivers? get benefits. And I happened to encounter one of these people while I was outside the Whole Foods and he asked me to sign this petition. And I engaged in a conversation with him and said, um, actually this will hurt the drivers, not help the drivers. And you don't need to sign a petition in order for a company to give their workers benefits. I said, I've never heard of that. Like that's what the <laughs> But you know, the average, the average person might not know this. And they think like what happened in California, that they're doing something good and positive to help the workers. And so many people regretted that decision that they made after they realized the ramifications from Prop 22. And so, you know, I went live, I took on Facebook. The poor guy didn't even know I was going live and I started <laughs> interviewing him and saying, hey drivers, everybody spread the word, you know, be respectful. But if you see any of these guys telling you to sign this petition, 
don't do it. It's, you know, it's a trap, it's a trap, it's a trap. Don't do it. Reach out to us. You know, we'll let you know. And just in a few short hours, just that video had over 500 views. So that is the power of social media. There's not 500 people in this room. However, with the power of social media and then tagging people, we, you know, they say to go for the low hanging fruit when it comes to organizing and then work your way up. You know, we are lucky to have, you know, Mona Wu, our new mayor, she is for our coalition. She against Prop 22. We have Elizabeth Warren. We have the sheriff of the Suffolk County Sheriff. We have our representatives. A lot of them have championed our cause and have joined with us to advocate for the drivers. So that's also something that's really important. You know, you want to just, you know, from the bottom up, really, you want to start from the bottom up and up and up and up and up. And it's just, it's just really beneficial. But also, I would love to say, you know, every single person that we tell about this, every person, every driver or person that sees that video that shares with social media or tags someone, and social media is one way that we're helping. It's one way that we're organizing, you know, and just get a commitment from people when it comes to next year to say no to Prop 22 and to not sign any petitions that you might think it's helping, but it's really actually going to hurt the drivers and other app and other app-based workers. And like Vina said, they are starting to do this to other categories. Thousands of workers in California lost their jobs. Um, you know, like the P card grocery delivery drivers, they have, we have that here in Massachusetts. Those are our middle class, good paying jobs with benefits. Those grocery stores in California are fired thousands of workers because, oh, we can just contract that out to Instacart. You know, let's save corporate some money but then this gets passed on to the taxpayers that's an increase of medicaid that's being paid out that's less workman's comp you know we don't have access to workman's comp most and most of the drivers they they don't know oh well if i don't have access to this i can get my own policy if they don't know this and then when something happens and they get hurt on the job you know, Uber, Lyft, nowhere to be found. We have a driver going through that right now. So it's just, we like to just give information that's helping the drivers and that also helps us organize when we give them information and resources that they also didn't know about. And even people, just even people in the community as well, especially, you know, our seniors, especially since they really do tend to vote and they and they really do care about the social issues because you know most of them are pensioners you know they come you know they were able to reap the benefits of the you know of the labor movement in the United States and we really want to focus and we want to stay organized we want to stay focused and we want to engage especially with our younger generation all generations so we can just protect these rights for all workers. And that's basically it. And thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Beth. And now uh, we'll hear from Peter. Uh, so then, uh, there we go. Hi. Um, it, I, I'm, I'm so glad to have been invited to be part of this. I wish I could be there with you in person, hope to be back before too terribly long. I miss you all. Um, so for better or worse, my job here is to focus on a slightly different angle, not so much on the substance of this question, but on how come it's on the ballot rather than being dealt with by the legislature and what that means for worker rights, for democracy. Um, and as probably many of you are aware, 
roughly half of the states have systems of initiative and referendum which allow voters to step in and to supersede the role of the legislature. Most of these initiative and referendum measures date back to the progressive era um, where they were part of a movement for what was often referred to as direct democracy. And the idea was to give citizens power to circumvent legislatures that were widely seen as the captives of special interests and unresponsive to social movements goals. Um, there's lots of interstate variation in the specifics of these. I don't want to go too deep into them, but I want to do two quick things. I'm trying to keep this short so that there'll be some, at least a little bit of time left for some questions and discussion. The two things I want to do is first, a little bit about the procedural specifics of the Massachusetts initiative system to, so you'll understand where the, the, this stands, where it's going to go over the coming months. But then I also want to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the real challenges and difficulties with the initiative system that are specifically revealed by the Prop 22 effort in California and now the movement to bring that same effort here to Massachusetts. But just a little bit about the procedural specific first. The basic process is if you want to put a question on the ballot, you draft it, you submit it to the attorney general, the attorney general reviews it and determines whether it meets the constitutional requirements for a valid initiative. If she approves it, you then have to go out and collect signatures, 3% as many signatures as voted in the last gubernatorial election, it's now something like 80,000 signatures you need to gather. Of course, if you have the resources to pay people to do your signature gathering, that's not a huge threshold, but it's a serious threshold. That process will end this week, and we'll see whether the proponents of the, the, this initiative gathered the, the required signatures. If they did, then in Massachusetts, and Massachusetts is somewhat different from many other states in this respect, the question then gets referred to the legislature. And the legislature has until May to act. They can adopt it, they can adopt an alternative to it, or they can do nothing. If they don't adopt it, then starting in May, the proponents need to go back and collect another small number, another, it's about 15, 20,000 additional signatures. And if they succeed in gathering those additional signatures, the question then will go on to the ballot um, and be decided by majority vote next November. Um, there are some restrictions on what you can put on the ballot. Um, in California, those restrictions, which are rather different than Massachusetts, have actually led a superior court to strike down Prop 22. So it is presently not in effect because it violated some of the procedural constraints. Different constraints from the ones in Massachusetts, not clear that that ruling will stand on appeal, but there's at least a story there. It's, the case is called Castellanos v. California, if you want to learn more about it. In Massachusetts, the most salient restriction, the one that might apply, is one that says all of the content of a ballot initiative has to be, quote, related or mutually dependent. And the Supreme Judicial Court has addressed this a, over a dozen times in the last 20 years, and the jurisprudence is a horrible mess. It's basically so indeterminate that it's very hard to predict when a measure meets that standard, when it doesn't. The opponents have suggested that the measure on the ballot isn't meeting that standard, is, is not all related or mutually dependent, particularly because the question does at least two things. One thing it does is to regulate the employment relationship between the workers and the gig companies. But the other thing it does is, and this goes back to something Carl said back at the very beginning, it says that the companies are not responsible in tort 
for the acts of the workers. So the opponents are arguing that that's a different matter, that it's not dependent on the matters about the employment relationship, and so that these are not related matters. I wouldn't be surprised if there's litigation about that between now and next spring. I don't think it's likely to succeed, but it's at least an interesting area for the lawyers among us to attend to. Let me turn, though, to, to the two broader concerns that, that I wanted to raise. The first one, um, Vina did a great job of explaining the arguments that the proponents used in California, but I don't think she explained why they were successful. The reason they were successful is that they spent $200 million on their campaign. That's a number no ballot question ever in the history of the country has ever come anywhere close to that level of spending. Each of Uber and Lyft and DoorDash threw $50 million into this campaign. The opponents spent a lot of money for a ballot campaign. They, they spent 20 million, but they were outspent 10 to one. That's not a ratio that you can manage. It's almost impossible to run a successful campaign when you're outspent to that vast extent. And this raises the, the big question that it raises, at least for me and for others who work in the direct democracy area, is have we lost the situation in which direct democracy really is a way to counteract special interest, or has it now just become another province dominated by special interests. We could talk about the First Amendment. We could talk about some of the challenges. It's a complicated challenge, but there's something very wrong. The second issue that I think is important to at least touch on is the very troubling history of the use of initiative and referendum as a tool to pursue racist results and results that disadvantage other marginalized groups. There's a long history of the use of initiative and referendum for fighting against fair housing measures, for fighting against affirmative action, for fighting against marriage equality. And as, as the other speakers have said, this is another case where we've got an initiative that is undermining the rights of immigrants, of people of color to a very large degree. Why does that happen? Well, instead of trying to tell the whole story, let me just refer you to a wonderful article written by Derek Bell almost 50 years ago, titled The Referendum, Democracy's Barrier to Racial Equality. And Bell analyzes what the dynamics that makes initiatives different from legislative process, particularly ballot questions, voters go into a secret ballot, they cast their ballot, no one knows if they're acting like racists. In legislative forums, at least some legislators don't want to be identified as acting like racists. Legislative process involves consensus building, trying to build alliances for future results. It tempers the behavior of legislators in ways that the behavior of ordinary voters is not tempered. And the result is that the underlying racism, anti-immigrant attitudes in American life play out in ballot questions in ways that they can't as much in legislative contexts. Big problem, big challenge. Um, I'm gonna stop there to leave at least a few minutes for questions, but I do wanna just end by um, reinforcing Beth's comments. This is a campaign that can be won, but it's only going to be won if lots and lots of people get off their seats and work hard, reach out to their networks, make connections, help get the word out, help people understand the complexities that you now understand better than 99.9% .9 of the others who are going to vote. So I hope that you'll join us in that effort.
while they're getting it um, back up and maybe looking for um, for Q and A, is it okay if I just to say one more thing? Just curiosity. Please do. Oh, okay. I was just going to say that emphasizing um, um, Peter's comments about the fact that they've spent two hundred and twenty-three million dollars on this campaign, um, and to state that in the coalition in Massachusetts is um, is trying to fundraise right now. Um, they formed really early, a year before they, before they even introduced the initiative. Um, we've gotten we've had com good conversations with community groups. We um, there are many reasons to believe that what will happen in Massachusetts is is different um, than than what will play out than what played out in California. Um, and and also just you know as a, as an aside because I feel like um, it exposes the the degree to which these companies are really really nefarious and will use their millions of dollars not just to to mislead the public and pass bad laws but one of the things that happened in California um, was that they used a big chunk of their money to harass critics, um, including, um, you know, following the following the, the lineage of tobacco companies and fossil fuel companies. Um, they uh, got all of our, they, for, I mean, speaking on my own behalf, they doxed me on social me media, they, their supporters doxed me, they, um, they asked for all of my emails and text messages. Um, a supporter filed a complaint of illegal lobbying against me. Um, they wrote six fake, fake news articles against me in my research in um, in the right wing blogosphere. One in a um, one in a in an op ed. Um, and part of part of why they're so you know they they go at this in, in such an ugly um, and nefarious way is because what is at, at risk here is um, is for them you know, billions and billions of dollars of profits, which would literally be squeezed out of the blood, sweat, and tears of, um, of working people. Um, it's such an ugly, um, really a horrible dynamic. Um, and, and I just hope that we can expose that in this fight. Um, I'm afraid that uh, we, we do have to vacate the, the, the room in about one minute. So uh, uh, with great apologies uh, that we didn't have chance for uh, a Q&A session with this wonderful panel, uh, maybe we'll be able to have them back again in some, some context so that you can, you can uh, uh, work with them directly. I want to thank all of the panelists for fantastic presentations. And once again to Shannon for uh, the, the heavy lifting. So thank you so much for being here.